from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what promises to be a very exciting program with author Maria Duenas, who will talk about her novel, an international bestseller, entitled The Time in Between. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, as you heard, Chief of the African Middle East Division, and when I was invited by the library to introduce an author at the National Book Festival, I chose to introduce Maria Duenas. The reason is that not only is her novel one of the most exciting novels I have read in a very long time, but also that she and I share a lot in common, although we just met. Like her, I started my professional life as an academic. She holds a PhD in English philology, and I won in international relations. She was a professor at the University of Murcia in Spain and has taught in a number of American universities as well. And I was a professor at the American University and Georgetown University in Washington, DC. She has written an international mystery set in Spain and Morocco. And I've written an international mystery series set in southern France. In my professional work, I have focused on North Africa, including on Morocco and the relation of that region to Europe, and more especially to France and Spain. And in fact, Prince Felipe de Bourbon, the Crown Prince of Spain, was my student at Georgetown University. And he wrote a paper for my graduate seminar on Spain's relation to Morocco and the Western Sahara. But let me tell you more about Maria Duenas' wonderful novel, The Time in Between which is also has appeared as the seamstress. So if you see the two titles, it's one and the same book, which is partly set in Tetuan, the capital of the Spanish protectorate of Morocco, and partly in Spain. Between 1912 and 1956, the northernmost part of Morocco was under a Spanish protectorate, while the rest of Morocco was under French colonial rule. In 1936, the Spanish civil war began. The army that was formed and became known as the Nationalist Army under the command of Francisco Franco had its roots in Morocco and included many Moroccans in its ranks. By March 1939, the civil war came to an end as the Nationalists won the war that cost anywhere between half a million and a million lives. And six months later, in September 1939, World War II began. Maria Duenas' story is set during this turbulent era, which offers a magnificent stage upon which to develop a drama in which suspense, adventure, excitement, and romance abound. Fabiola Santiago, the author of Reclaiming Paris, describes the time in between as, quote, luxuriously landscaped with exotic geographies and international intrigue. Wars break down social conventions. The roles of men and women in society change. Social propriety and decorum vanish. People's real character comes to light as they attempt to survive with their strengths, their weaknesses, their foibles, and their sense of ethics and morality. It is her protagonist, Sierra Quiroga, a seamstress, who emerges from all this as a rich and memorable character fashioned by the events that surround her, but driven by her own natural intelligence, perseverance, and sense of self. Santiago writes that the book is as smooth to read as the tailored lines of the haute couture her unforgettable protagonist creates. To quote another writer, Daisy Martinez, I'm quoting, the time in between is an epic novel with an unlikely Spanish heroine, Sierra Quiroga, that takes us through one of the most turbulent times in Europe, the onset of World War II. Sierra travels on a journey through romance, love, loss, and intrigue, all the while discovering traits that she never dreamt she had. So sit back and enjoy this afternoon's presentation with Maria Duenas, because she's truly a master storyteller. The Nobel Prize laureate, Mario Vargas Loza, has said of the time in between that it is, quote, 
a wonderful novel in the good old tradition with intrigue, love, mystery, and tender, audacious, and well-drawn characters. So now, Maria Duenas. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really thrilled and honored to be here today, surrounded by old friends, new friends, readers, and future readers. And what I want to do with you today in this beautiful afternoon in Washington is to share uh, this adventure that started when I was around six years ago, when I was just a university professor who had never had the ambition of becoming a writer. That, um, it happened, as so many other things in life. It happened, and I had the time, and I had the personal and professional equilibrium, and I decided that I wanted to do something new, to add a new layer to my life, and I decided to start imagining and composing a novel. The original idea started with a handful of memories associated with the Spanish protectorate of Spain in Morocco an area that was under the Spanish uh, colonial administration, sort of colonial administration, for 44 years in the first half of the 20th century. A territory that became home for tens of thousands of expatriated Spaniards and the land that never vanished from the minds of those who, after Morocco's independence in 1956, left their houses, their friends, their dreams to start a new life in peninsular Spain. Most of them did so with their hearts broken under the perspective of never returning to the world they were leaving behind. And among those Spaniards who lived in Morocco during the protectorate times was my own family. My grandfather worked for the Spanish administration uh, in the protectorate for more than 30 years. And my mother, who was the youngest of five kids, was born there in Tetuan, the capital city of at that time of the protectorate at that time. And she moved to Spain when she was 18. So when, when I was growing up, every time my mom wanted to refer to her childhood years, young years, to her friends, uh, schoolmates, teachers, first loves, or any memories of childhood, she had to look back to Morocco. So I grew up with that reference in my mind all the time. And uh, she, along with my grandparents and the rest of the family, were the ones who transmitted to me not only the information, uh, but also the fascination and the nostalgia of those old days of Spanish presence in Northern Africa. So when I decided to embark myself on this adventure of writing a book, before I had a plot or any characters in my mind, the only certainty I had was that wherever my story would end up, would end up being, um, it all would stem from that lost Moroccan world. But I knew that in order to revisit that old world, I needed more information, more factual data beyond my old family memories. And so I decided to start my research. And uh, as it commonly happens in Spain, when we look back to our recent past, my steps took me to the Civil War, uh, a horrible period that altered our future as a nation, that broke families and divided communities, and that eventually that led us to 40 long years of dictatorship. And reading about the war in Morocco, I found out about the roles played at that time in that area by three very charismatic and highly controversial historical characters. One of them was uh, Juan Luis Begbeder, who was that at that time was the High Commissioner of Spain in Morocco, a military man in Franco's band, Franco's national band during the war. The second character, historical character, was Rosalind Fox, a young British, quite eccentric, a bit extravagant lady who was Bakebeather's lover at that time. And the third character was Ramon Serrano Suñer, who was Franco's brother-in-law and his closest advisor during the war. Now, the connection of these three characters, I learned, started when Serrano Suñer 
on behalf of Franco visited the protectorate in the summer of 1937 and continued when a couple of years later the war ended in 1939 and Franco decided to appoint uh, Serrano Sr., his brother-in-law, as the head of the Department of the Interior and Begveder as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Initially, these two men had a good relationship and in fact, it was Serrano Sr., the one who persuaded Franco to appoint Begveder as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. That it all exploded when the Second World War broke out just a few months later. Uh, as you probably know, and if, in case you don't know, I'll let you know, uh, Spain uh, never was officially engaged in the Second World War as the country was completely devastated our, after our own civil war. But Spain was, even when not participated, Spain was the site of a good deal of intrigues and conspiracies of political and strategical complexities related to the European war. The official position of Franco's administration was initially one of neutrality, but this proved not to be true at all. And while Franco and his brother-in-law, Serrano Sr., maintained um, an evident yet unofficial pro-Axis, pro-German, pro-Nazi position, Begveder, at the same time, persuaded by his British lover, Rosalind Fox, this young, a bit eccentric woman, uh, he decided, even when he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs and he was expected to follow the official government line, he decided to adopt a completely different position. Adopted, he adopted an open pro-British position which eventually led him to his destitution and his arrest. So the fortunes, when I read about all these people, these three characters mainly, the, his, their fortunes and misfortunes and the intensity of the historical events they lived made me make three decisions. I hadn't started writing the book at all. I didn't even have the first line. I knew nothing about what I was going to write, up the plot and the, and the uh, kind of components I wanted to in incorporate into my text, but I made three initial decisions. The first one was that even when I didn't have the intention of writing a purely historical novel because I wanted to construct a fiction, uh, but even when it, if it would never be historical, I thought that these three characters, these three historical figures would somehow become part of my fiction. The second decision was that after the Moroccan setting that I had originally in my mind, I would somehow transfer the scope of my novel from Northern Africa to pro-German, pro-Nazi Madrid in the early 40s, right after the, the Civil War and at, in parallel with the beginning of the Second World War. And finally, I made the decision to add to my plot a component of clandestinity and conspirations of secret services and espionage linked to World War II, which were so active in Spain at that time. And the, being the situation so, the ingredients I had for my novel, for this novel that I hadn't started yet, were the geographical scenarios, the historical characters, and the conflict between the Axis and the Allies in Spain, plus this additional component of espionage I wanted to integrate. And I knew that I needed something else, and that's how I made my final decision. I thought that I needed, what I needed was a connection. A connection, like a link to, to provide the whole thing with coherence and consistency. And that's how Sira Quiroga, my main character, was born as a bridge to connect reality and fiction as a link to combine the real historical characters and the circumstance, their circumstances around them with the new imaginary story I wanted to build. And for this purpose, I created a fully fictional character, a young woman with a universe of her own, with a group of people around her who'd eventually become the secondary fictional characters, and with a path to follow that would constitute the backbone of the book. 
Uh, Sarah, my character, was born as a humble seamstress in pre-war Madrid, an innocent girl, the daughter of a single mother, who left school at the age of 12 to start working for a prestigious couturier. A working girl, as many others, with an insignificant job, a demure boyfriend, and a very, very modest uh, future ahead. A common girl whose simple life blows up when she passionately falls in love with the wrong man, as we can all expect. Now, from that moment onwards, everything will change in Sarah's life. She will leave her boyfriend, her mother, her hometown, her country, to follow her lover from Madrid to Morocco, initially to 10 years, just to find out a few months later that her decision to follow this man was a huge, huge mistake. But it's too late. Now it's too late. The civil war has erupted in Spain. Madrid is isolated. Nobody can leave Madrid. Nobody can get into Madrid. And Shira cannot go backwards. And so alone, betrayed, sick, broken, and full of depths, She's forced to, to summon all her courage and strength to survive in the turmoil of times. And so she will move from a place to another from 10 years where she's abandoned by her lover to Tetuan, the capital of the Spanish protectorate in Morocco, and later eventually from Tetuan to Madrid. She will, along the story, she will reinvent herself as a prestigious dressmaker. She will set her own business. She will meet a whole range of both historical and fictional characters who will push her towards the most unexpected adventures. And she will commit herself to a task that will eventually contribute to maintaining, to keeping Spain out of the war, out of the European war. I'm often asked why I decided to make Syria a seamstress. And the answer is simple and straightforward. I didn't have many options. Um, at the time, in the late 30s and early 40s, women in Spain, I think all over the world, but mainly, very particularly in Spain, women hardly ever had any professional opportunities that could uh, allow them to be independent, autonomous women, uh, unless the, they had a family or a husband who could support them. Uh, so that's the main reason she needed to be independent. She needed money, she needed a job. And the second reason was that um, I thought that she needed also some opportunities for class mobility. Because I needed Sarah, the fictional character, and Rosalind Fox, the historical character, to become friends. And how could I make connect a working class girl from old Madrid with a high society British lady who is having an affair with the most powerful man in colonial Morocco? Well, I thought my decision was that I would connect them by means of a couture atelier, by means of Rosalind Fox in need of clothes and Sarah in need of money. And additionally, both of them in need of friendship. Now, beyond her own universe as a seamstress, as a dressmaker, and her connection with real life characters, uh, historical characters. I thought that Sarah also needed some friends of her own, characters with whom she could share her fictional nature, characters who will accompany her along the way, and characters who I decided that would belong to three different spheres, family, friends, and lovers. And so I created a sequence of characters like Dolores and Gonzalo Alvarado, who are Syrian's, Syria's parents. They never get married because they somehow uh, follow the pattern of that time. He belonged to a rich, uh, wealthy, uh, high society family. She was just a humble seamstress, so there was no possibility, no option for marriage. That uh, how Spain worked at that time. Um, Sarah will also have friends like Candelaria and Felix, for example, in Tetuan, who will be their, uh, her companions, but also her teachers in many things. They will open Sarah's eyes to, to life in many senses. And there will be, in the, in the sphere of lovers, there will be three very different men, men with very different styles. Ignacio first, the young, uh, boyfriend, uh, Ramiro, who is the man who abandons her, and Marcus, who is going to be her final love. 
three men who alternatively became serious partners and opened her life to new adventures and opportunities, some of them very unexpected, some of them uh, more predictable ones. And finally, I thought that what Sarah needed was a path to follow, a path that would take her from old Madrid, from Madrid, Castizo de la Plaza de la Paja of her childhood years and young years, to a very different Madrid because the book has, has sort of a circular structures. It starts in Madrid, in, in uh, popular Madrid, and ends up in Madrid after going to other places. In a very different Madrid, a sophisticated cluster of, of one of the areas of Madrid full of aristocrats, diplomats, and foreigners who had nothing to do with the hardship of that other Madrid devastated after the war. Cyrus' steps will also take her to Morocco, as I said, initially to Tangiers, later to Tetuan. And as she moves from place to place, she also climbs up the social scale. She increases her glamour, she learns about the world, and she enters a new dimension of international parties and hotels, casinos, and first-class sophistication. She will end up cooperating with the British to keep Spain out of the war, as I said. But what is important, I think, is that she does all this without betraying herself, without forgetting who she is and where she comes from. And the Sira Kirawa we find at the end of the book will have a new identity and will never be again the sweet, innocent girl we met on page one. She's now a grown-up woman in command of her own life, but she's still a woman who has, who keeps the authenticity and the essence of the young seamstress we once met. And I think this is one of the reasons why this authenticity she never loses. This is one of the reasons that has touched the hearts of, of so many readers around the world who had followed Cyrus' steps in 27 languages in many different countries and continents. And that's the reason why I'm here today with Syrah in English in the time in between, and very happy to share with you all my adventure and Syrah's adventure as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And if, if you have any questions or comments or whatever you want to say, I'll be more than happy to answer. Yep. Okay. Oh, hi. I just read your book this summer and uh -huh. loved it. And Thank I really you. encourage everybody to read it. It's a great read. I'm wondering what happened? Did Beg Spider, uh, he, he goes off to Rhonda. Does he, does he live? And uh, what, <laughs> well, it wasn't quite clear. And what happens to Ro uh, Rosalinda Fox? And are you going to do a sequel? Okay. Um, good questions, <laughs> the three of them. Big Brother, actually, I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about him these days when, while I'm here in Washington because after he was arrested and sent to prison in, in Rwanda by Franco, and then he was released and he was out, and he was here and there doing nothing because he never was, uh, had any, any commitment or any uh, political or military position ever since. But at a point during the war, I think around the year 42 or 43, or even 44, when things were changing and now Franco knew that the Germans, uh, his friends, were not winning the war, he decided to send Bakewether here to Washington. Nobody knows what for. Some people think it was to, to um, arrange some contracts to get gas for Spain. Some other people say it was just to persuade the American government that Franco was a very good guy and deserves to be well treated after the war, even when he was very pro-German. But nobody really knew what he did here. He lived here for two years. And we still don't know. I mean, probably some people know, but it's not common knowledge what he did. And he ended up, well, he went back to Spain and he died in, in 1957. And Rosalind Fox died just a few years ago, like five, six years ago. She lived in southern Spain in Cadiz area. 
um, in the, this house she built to share in this, with the intention of sharing it with the Begvedere, but since he died, he, they could never live there together. And that was the second question. And the third question was a, about a sequel, right? No sequel. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, my second book has just been published in Spain a few weeks ago, but it has nothing to do. But that's a question many people ask me because the end is a bit, a little bit open. No, what we have, instead of a sequel, is a television series in Spain, which has already been filmed, not on air yet. We're expecting probably this, this fall we'll, we'll be able to watch it. But it's very, very nice. A long series, 11 uh, episodes, long episodes, and it was filmed in the original locations they moved to. Uh, to Morocco and to Lisbon and everywhere, so it's beautiful. You can see some sequences on the web. If you Google um, El Tiempo Entre Costuras, which is the, time, the title in Spanish, and then Antena Tres, Antenas, it sounds three, which is the name of the television channel, you'll be able to see a few minutes, and it's beautiful, really. So we'll see. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Okay. Thank you very much for your book. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you a simple question. I know that you say your family came from Tetuan and, uh -huh. and you had a lot of stories about that. But in terms of research, uh, do you, uh, can you recommend any good research books about Tangiers in the late 30s prior to, to mm -hmm. Franco taking over? There aren't many, really. I used all kinds of resources, like academic books and history books and old newspapers, and I talked to a lot of old people who still have some memories. There is one book written by Victor Gonzalez Lezcano, who is a professor at, uh, at um, I think it's uh, UNED, Univers National University of, of distance education in Spain. Victor Gonzalez Lexcano, I think it's his name. And not much, really, as a whole corpus. Of, but, but you can find information here or there. But it's a bit difficult to follow the, the track of what happened during those years. But uh, my book has a bibliography at the back, at the end of it, so you can check some of those sources and maybe you'll find something interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I, I just loved your book. I couldn't put it down. Thank you. And I so identified with Sira in the way that she started off as this young, insecure woman who needed people to tell her how to do things and grew into this like powerful, smart, strong woman. But it seemed like she was sort of the last person to realize that that's what she was, you yeah. know, this amazing, strong woman. And I was wondering how you kept that balance, how you kept the internal, like, insecurity and the um, external presence of her in the world as, a, as, write, as you were writing it. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I think Sarah is always having a hard time because she's all the time struggling between her fears and her, her problems and the brave girl everybody expects her to be. So there is a constant struggle and a constant fight so that she can cope with these circumstances that push her to move towards she doesn't know where. So I think it, 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 it was for me it was a bit difficult to keep this balance because sometimes I wanted her to be more like brave and uh, a real spy and a real um, compromised woman. At the same time, I had to, to keep remembering that she was just a modest, sweet girl, innocent girl from old Madrid. So I had to be balancing both sides all the time. But um, I hope I can, could manage to make her a plausible character. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. El, el libro me encantó. Muchas gracias. Y, y, um, sorry. And, um, <laughs> I, I spent, I, I read it very quickly, but I spent so much time doing research because I knew about the Spanish Civil War. My grandparents are from Spain, but oh. I had no idea about Rosalind Fox or any of that. So it was just like, like a history lesson. Oh, great, and, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. Number one, when is Mission Olvido coming out here? <laughs> and number two, how did you, um, it's so easy for a character like Sita to, be, to become dependent on men. Mm -hmm. But none of the three men, for better or for worse, you know, the, uh, 
her experience. Ignacio was so sweet, and then he became Ignacio. And then the horrible experience in Tangier. But Marcus, who was you know dashing and all that, she never became a victim. She was even in Estoril, where it was scary, and she could have just given up and and fallen you know you know to, under the guise of this man or whatever. She how did it was just so refreshing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, regarding the first, your first comment about this, uh, what you have learned about the Civil War, I'm very happy to hear that because that's what, that was one of the things I wanted to do with my book. I mean, as I told you before, I've been teaching for, for 20 years, and I somehow um, still have some pedagogical thing inside me that make me um, try to write something that teaches something to the readers along with telling them a story, which can be much or uh, more or less interesting. I always want to, to teach something new, a little sequence of our history or the life of a period or something that happened in the past that could contribute to increase the knowledge of the readers. And this, rega oh, regarding Mission Olvido, my second novel, it was just published in Spain a few weeks ago, on August the 28th, it's working very well. It has to do a lot with the United States because the part of the novel uh, takes place in a, on a fictional campus in California, but it goes back to Spain all the time. It has to do with uh, Spanish presence in the US, particularly in the Southwest in California during the mission times, and uh, it has to do with uh, the uh, Spanish intellectuals that were um, accepted by American universities during their exile after Franco's uh, victory, after the, the Spanish Civil War. And it has to do with Americans going to Spain to, to the American military bases in Spain and to the intellectuals who became uh, professors of Spanish and went to follow the steps of our writers and intellectuals at the time. So it's a, it's a book that crosses uh, borders and uh, oceans and uh, make us learn that we have, our two countries have a lot in common and, uh, well, and I'm not going to tell you anything else because I want you to read it. I don't know. Right, about the translation into English, I don't know yet. I don't know yet anything, but I hope. In Espanol, uh, I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, because I don't think it will be published in Spanish until it's translated into English. But it can be, I, I mean, you can get the, the, the Spanish edition from Spain, Amazon, or that I hope you enjoyed because it has to do a lot with our two nations and our common spirit at some certain points of history. And uh, more questions, sorry. Hi, um, I'm about 100 pages into In the Time Between and uh, I just wanted to say it's very refreshing reading your book because a lot of people who come from academia when they try to write novels, you know, they come off as very dry but yours is very fluent. And I was just wondering um, if you had published this in Spanish previously, what was that transition like in translating it to English? How much input did you have? And what was the difficulty, if, there, if any, in doing that translation? Okay, okay, thank you for the question because that's interesting. Uh, I didn't translate the book. There was a professional translator who did it for the publishers, uh, but he was, I think he did a great job. I think it's a beautiful translation. And he, we were in contact. He came to see me to Spain. We emailed each other a lot with questions and comments. He would send me whole chunks of, of text. Check this, check that, or what do you think about this, or what do you think about that? So I, I was very, very happy with the way he worked and with the result, of course. What is Fun. The fun thing is that uh, there was a little mistake with the title in the in the um, uh, book with the, in the program. That's it, because they say that uh, the time in between is my second novel after the seamstress, which was the <laughs> one, which is completely wrong because there, I only have one novel. The thing is, this this mi little mistake is is understandable, because even when the text is the same one both in Britain and in Spain, the title in English is The Seamstress and the title in America is The Time In Between. 
which is a weird thing I cannot find an explanation for. But, but well, these things happen. But I think it's a beautiful translation. And many English speaker readers tell me, oh, I didn't know it was a translation. I thought it was originally written in English because it sounds so natural and so, so uh, like, how do you say this in English? Uh, fluido. Carmelina, yeah, help me. Yeah. <laughs> fluent. Fluent. <laughs> Sorry. Fluent. Well, thank you very much. I know where we are now. Oh, Hola. Thanks. Hola. Uh, I'm a member of a book club that we tend to, we gravitate to women's writers, especially mm -hmm. Hispanic. Um, we're reading, I selected your book for January. So I would like to get your opinion about should we concentrate in the historical part of your book or the characters part of your book? Ew, that's a hard question. Uh, I think both. I mean, the historical part can be very interesting to, to let you know of the background, the historical background of what happened in Spain at that time. And probably you are not very familiar with what happened there because it's just a little, I mean, in comparison, it's just a country which has not much to do with American history in the 20th century. At the same time, I think that what happens to the characters in uh, human terms, in personal terms, is interesting too because um, there are some universal passions and feelings and attitudes that are there that can appeal to every kind of, of reader. So I th I'm sure you will like that too. So why don't you try to tackle both sides? We'll try. Okay. We'll give it <laughs> our best shot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm also a member of a book club. Uh -huh. We're a group of Latin American women living in the DC right. area. And we read um, Spanish authors. Uh-huh, great. So we were, when we read this book, we were all very um, charmed by Rosalinda Fox uh -huh. and her life. So I, I was curious, number one, did you ever have a chance to meet her? And if not, was she ever aware that she featured prominently in your book? Yeah, well, that, that's a question that I, I would like to, I would love to answer in a positive way, but I have to un answer in a negative way because I never had the chance to meet her. When I decided to write the book, she had died like three, four years before, not much. But I had the chance to contact one of her nieces who live in the Canary Islands. And um, she told me that oh, if she had been able to, I mean, if she could have managed to, to extend her life to know that she was going to be the character of a novel, she would be so happy. <laughs> yeah, because she was a woman that who liked to, to show around and to show off and to be very, like a protagonist of every single party. She had a very strong personality, a very strong character. And uh, she says she would be so delighted. <laughs> but I think she was a difficult woman too, so I, I prefer her dead. <laughs> just, just in case, just in case. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, uh, hi. Hola. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Bien, ¿y tú? Encantada. Um, I'm, a, well, I'm from Spain, mm -hmm. and I'm a PhD student I here. I have the same jacket you have oh, from really? Sarah. That's not why I knew that you were from Spain. <laughs> we all dress the We're same way We identify each other somehow, <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, I'm doing my PhD here in Spanish Women Writers. Mm -hmm. um, oh. And when you were talking, about, I mean, I read your novel, and I loved it, and I was, you know, by listening to you um, explaining about the novel, it was coming to me that there's a constant uh, interest in a lot of these Spanish women writers nowadays, like, you know, Laia Fabregas, Olga Merino, you know, some other uh, uh, recent uh, female authors, in dealing with the Spanish Civil War as the background in their plots, you know? So I'm just wondering, um, because we, it's been done, and, you know, Almodovar has done the same, and, I'm just wondering if that's the way that we're trying to deal with these unresolved issues from the Spanish Civil War, like the ghosts are coming back, and if is, is that a way to get, to deal with the unresolved issues as a nation mm -hmm. through literature? Uh -huh. Well, it, it depends. I think Spanish Civil War was so 
sad, so intense, so terrible, that even when we don't want, as it was my case, I didn't want to focus my novel on the civil war. I didn't have any interest at all. But every time you look back, the war is there, and the consequences of the war are there. So we, we are forced to confront the war one way or another. Mm -hmm. There are some authors who uh, purposefully focus on the war, uh, mm -hmm. Almudena Grandes, yeah. or Ima Chacon, yeah. Yeah, like talking about women. Mm -hmm. And there are some of them who don't have that intention initially, like me, uh -huh. but in the end, you have to somehow cover something. Because it's, as you say, it's something that it's finished, it's closed, but it's still it's something recurrent. And, and uh, what is good is that we explore all the different uh, aspects from different angles and just feel free to keep talking and discussing and, and explaining or trying to find explanations for what happened, just so that we never repeat that yeah. again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, any more questions? They're telling me we have five more minutes, a few more minutes. No, no, yeah, over there. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. You can order your book on Amazon. Yeah. It, it says one to two months to get it. Really? Yes. In Spanish, you mean? In Spanish. But the new Spanish. one? The new one. The oh, new the new one. one. Yes. Really? That's what it said. So if you can do anything to get it faster, it would be great. <laughs> I'll do it. I don't know what I can do, it, but I'll try. And uh, what that's weird because it takes like less than a, 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 than a week to for mail to. I have relatives in Spain. They can get it to me faster. I that's think. good. <laughs> that's the best solution. <laughs> Thank you. Thank gracias you. por estar esta tarde aquí. Eh? Muchas gracias. Eh, we are part of a book club, and uh, I bought your book some years. I mean, like two years ago in Spain, Thank and you. I couldn't put it down. And, and, and your characters travel with me back and forth. I mean, it's like I cannot read, get rid of them. Um, Thank you. So we are very excited, and we wanted this afternoon to be here to see who was the great person who wrote this, so we can Thank enjoy. Thank you Thank so you. much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I was. I was a bit worried because I'm one of the very few um, international authors and th at this festival, uh, and uh, I, I didn't know if I would have anyone here, <laughs> besides my friend Carmelina and her family, and uh, a, few, a few friends of my friend Titi who told me it, who would be around, and, uh, and my publicist, <laughs> Diana Franco. And so I'm so happy to see so many people and, and, and to know that many of you have already read the book and enjoyed the book and know the characters and know everything. So really, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm much happier now. <laughs> thank you. And uh, well, I think that's it's time to finish. Well, thank you very much, really, for being here, for reading my book. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.